I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. How do human beings find their way around their planet? How do they know what lies beyond the sea, or where a road leads? Did Marco Polo have an atlas to show him the route to China? Did the Romans record the borders of their empire on maps? For thousands of years, unknown distant lands guarded their secrets, and yet they were described in travel books and imaginative maps. The face of the world has fascinated people in every age and culture. We hold the face of the world in our hands in the form of a map of the earth. We know where the mountains are, where the rivers flow to, and how far the oceans extend, even though we have never been there. The invention of maps and charts is a fascinating chapter in human history. In the beginning, there are fantastic descriptions, mystical depictions, Later on, maps and charts for seafarers and soldiers. From their limited resources, people of bygone ages attempt to create a picture of the world, of their own region, and of distant lands. With their eyes fixed on far-off goals, merchants discover new trade routes, soldiers conquer new territories, warlords take possession of the world and impose their rule on foreign peoples. The map is an instrument of their power. The atlas, showing us the world in a series of detailed maps, was only completed a hundred years ago. Early cultures scratch their concept of the world on clay tablets or chisel them into stone. Others paint what they know. The ancient Greeks write down what they have seen of the world. It is a long way from the first inaccurate descriptions of the world to the maps of today which guide us unerringly to any spot on the face of the globe. A way full of adventure and errors. The art of cartography goes back to the time of the Sumerians. The earth floats in an ocean. Above it curves the sky, and beneath it lies hell. That's how the Sumerians see their cosmos. The rivers of the Euphrates and the Tigris are the sources of prosperity and a sophisticated culture. 5,000 years ago, the Sumerians know the geography of their empire. The map is scratched on clay. It was made 600 years before Christ. It shows the course of the two rivers to the sea and the major cities. The map is a basis for the functioning administration of the empire. In 2300 BC, in Babylon, a geography textbook is produced. Even so long ago, caravans travel from southern Arabia to the Mediterranean. At that time, 
no one could know who would later profit from the geographical knowledge of these ancient cultures. Es war damals noch nicht ausgemacht, dass die Europäer die Welt entdecken sollten. At that time, it wasn't evident that the Europeans were to discover the world. But if we are to pinpoint the beginning of European expansion, then we'd probably locate it in the 8th century BC. In this century, the ancient Greeks began to extend their power, establishing subsidiary cities, colonies on the Black Sea, the north coast of Africa, the western Mediterranean region, on Sicily and the other islands. And one response to the founding of these colonies is apparently that in the 8th century BC, Homer wrote down the story of Odysseus, the story of his voyages over the seas. So Odysseus is probably the first European whose travels were narrated. Homer's Odyssey is not just the story of a great voyage. For the people of that epoch, it is at the same time also a fascinating description of the known world, the Mediterranean world. The Odyssey traces the routes to the great cities, temples and holy places. It describes the sea route from Greece to Sicily. The reader learns how to get to the Colossus of Rhodes. Homer sends his hero, Odysseus, on a great voyage. This is presumably based on the descriptions of seafarers who knew exactly where to go and how to get there thanks to their periphers, their route planners. These navigational aids are ancient and represent the first explorations of the world by people such as merchants and seafarers, but also scholars and poets. Odysseus is only one among many. Take, for example, Hecateus of Miletus or Herodotus, who travelled the world, leaving us descriptions of what they had seen, the earliest of their kind that we possess. These seafarers were familiar with more than just the Mediterranean. They also knew the rough waters of the Atlantic and the North Sea. Contemporary sources suggest that there were trading links extending from the Mediterranean to Northern Europe. One thing is certain, the Phoenicians sailed far to the east, towards India. They circumnavigate Africa, sailing from the west. It is possible that the Phoenicians reached the British Isles and even further north. They tell of a land they call Thule, where the sun never sets. All over the world, people are traveling. For thousands of years, the ship is the most important and effective means of exploring the world. But the knowledge of those ancient maritime explorers has been lost. Homer's Odyssey is an exception. Other written accounts have been destroyed or never existed in the first place. 3,000 years ago, in the South Sea Islands, people are setting sail into the unknown. They call themselves they who sail long distances. Their settlements extend over an area as great as the surface of the moon. They sail without compasses or charts, a nautical wonder. They navigate from island to island, guided by experience alone, by word of mouth, oral tradition. Their picture of the world is not something they hold in their hands. Instead, it is put into words.
At the same time, thousands of kilometers to the west, there are ships plying regularly between Arabia and India. Again, their crews know nothing of sea charts. The Arabian seafarers navigate only by the stars. Nevertheless, they are masters of the Indian Ocean and find their way unerringly to the ports of India. From there, they bring rare spices to Arabia. Their familiarity with the sea routes makes them rich, and they write down their precious knowledge about the sea in nautical handbooks. Here, sailors find information about the winds and currents, about shallows and safe harbors. Concepts of the Earth begin to emerge in antiquity among the natural philosophers of Ionia. Some of them conceive of the world as a disk, others as a rectangle, still others as a ball. And these images are used to collate all the knowledge gathered from seafarers, merchants and scholars. The assembled wisdom of antiquity is then finally brought together in the late period by the geographers Pomponius, Mela and Ptolemy and set out as a map. Ptolemy's maps became the undisputed standard into the Middle Ages and are still of significance today for our geographical image of the world. Using the descriptions set down by Pomponius Mela, cartographers drew maps of the Roman world. They show Europe, Africa, and Asia. But more important to the Romans than a picture of the world is knowledge of the empire's road network. In the year 80, at the time of Pomponius Mela, the Roman road network extends as far as Scotland. 75,000 kilometers of roads link Rome to its most distant province. On their travels, the Romans were presumably guided by these maps. Initially, it was the soldiers. On the roads, the military had priority. The map shows the route through Gaul and then on to Germania. For most people at that time, the Roman Empire only existed in their minds. This is still the case, centuries later, for Charlemagne, who sees himself as the successor to the Roman emperors. In the year 800, on Weihnachtstag, wird Karl, the König der Franken und Langobard, in the year 800, on Christmas Day, Charles, the King of the Franks and the Lombards, is crowned Emperor in Rome. It is a mark of his triumph, a triumph that was signalled in 774 when Charles conquered the Lombardian Empire and so created the link between Franconia and Italy. But even before his coronation, Charles had also considerably extended the Franconian Empire to the east with the annexation of Bavaria and to the north by his conquest of the Saxons as far as the Eider Line. Essentially, this was the creation of the core of Europe. How Charlemagne gets to know the shape and size of his empire is a puzzle. Pictorial maps no longer exist. The Romans' maps have vanished along with their roads. So for his journey over the Alps, Charles must rely on verbal descriptions of the route, which is how the flocks of pilgrims find their way to Rome. Charlemagne was a great general. 
But how did he lead his army from, say, Aachen or Frankfurt, or Worms to Rome? Spain or Saxony? The answer is simpler than you might think. On the one hand, there were still a few Roman roads he could use. And on the other hand, the land wasn't nearly as cultivated as later, when the swamps were drained and the forest cut down, so there were relatively few roads to travel by. Rivers could only be crossed at a few fords, so travelers tended to bunch together at certain places. This made it relatively easy to find one's way to Rome. There were only two passes to the south suitable for an army to cross. One was the Brenner and the other was the Aosta Valley. Similarly, there were only two roads to Saxony, one from Frankfurt and the other, the famous Hellweg, via Dortmund towards the Weser Valley. So it was relatively easy to find your way. To get to Rome from Middle Franconia, you simply headed south. And you knew how many stages the journey consisted of. For the king, with or without his army, the journey was measured in units of days, from one castle to the next, or from way station to way station. There are no maps in the Middle Ages, yet merchants and soldiers travel confidently throughout Europe. They are guided by rivers and signs. Verbal descriptions serve in place of maps, and guide the travelers safely to their destinations. The migration of whole peoples is also a step into the unknown. How they knew the route to Rome or Carthage, no one knows. But the legendary Vikings too also managed without maps. Tradition has it that the age of the Vikings begins with the plundering of Lindisfarne in the year 793. During the next decades, the Vikings appear mainly as the plunderers of Western Europe and the Iberian Peninsula. Later, however, in the 10th and 11th centuries, they were also the founders of a number of completely new empires. The Duchy of Normandy, the Kingdom of Sicily, and even the State of Russia. What's more, they were the first Europeans to cross the North Atlantic to the American continent. Via Iceland, which they discovered and settled at the end of the 9th century, and Greenland, where they established permanent settlements at the end of the 10th century, as far as Newfoundland, Labrador, and maybe even as far as New England. With their fast ships, they conquered new worlds. Wherever they appear, the seafarers spread fear and terror. The Vikings attack settlements and plunder towns, such as Paris. But how they navigate on the open sea remains a mystery. Their ships sail as far as the Mediterranean and North America. A map is said to have shown them the route across the Atlantic. According to the Viking sagas, Beyond the sea lies Vinland, where grapes grow in profusion and pasture is plenty. Evidence of the Vikings' clear picture of the world is the Vinland map. But today cartographers are sure that the Vinland map is a forgery. The Vikings sailed without maps. The Vinland map wasn't drawn until the 20th century. By the Middle Ages, the extensive geographical knowledge of antiquity has been forgotten or lost without trace. Now it is the church which decides what the world looks like. The picture of the world is determined by the Christian faith and no longer by scientific knowledge.
but it is not right to call this the Dark Ages. Rulers have a clear picture of the extent and borders of their empires. Scholars know that the Earth is round. All they dispute is the size of its circumference. The First Crusade begins in 1096. The Christian powers want to recapture the Holy Land from the Muslims. During the next three centuries, the Crusaders' goal is Jerusalem. But who shows these knights from the north and west of Europe the way to the Holy Land? How do they even know where Jerusalem is? At the center of the world, according to this map of the late Middle Ages. Seafarers navigate by the coastline. They steer by the sun and the stars. For maps drawn according to religious beliefs are inaccurate. As nautical guides, they cannot be fully trusted. The Venetians know their way around the sea. They live surrounded by the sea. And from here begins a great phase of global exploration. Venice is alive with fantastic tales about distant lands lying to the east. In the 13th century, European ideas are formed by assumptions and hearsay. Real experiences come richly decorated. Legends have it that the Emperor of China is the wealthiest man in the world. From China come the rare spices in which the Venetians trade and grow prosperous. In China, it is said there is an abundance of gold and silk. Marco Polo is the first to bring the Venetians a factual account of this land. Marco Polo is not the first European to voyage to China, but his account of his travels becomes better known than any other. Marco Polo set sail in 1271. He is 17 years old. He cannot suspect that it will be many years before he returns. He travels by ship from Venice to the Holy Land. Marco Polo is accompanied by his father and his uncle. Their purpose is to establish new trade links for Venice. The merchants Niccolo and Maffeo Polo had already ventured far to the east. In a journey lasting six years, they had traveled from Venice via the Crimea and through the deserts of Asia to the court of the Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan. They wish to return there. The journey to distant Peking will take four years. From Arabia, the three men travel overland further eastwards. They cross Afghanistan and the Taklam Khan and Gobi deserts. They will not have depended on maps but on the local knowledge of the indigenous peoples, their stories and descriptions. How far it is to Peking is not written down somewhere. Where the right road leads is known only to the guide. The route to their destination only exists in the traveler's minds. 
their knowledge feeds on stories and their own experience. In the meantime, Marco Polo is 21. He travels in strange worlds and cultures without a map. 300 years later, his account of his travels is still being read. In more than a hundred different manuscripts, it circulates throughout Europe. After 24 years, Marco Polo returns to Europe by sea. The account of his journey forms the basis for the first European maps, the Portulani. Every harbor is marked. A first map of the world has been drawn. But systematic cartography only comes into existence thanks to a completely different event. Die Eroberung Konstantinopels im Jahre 1453 durch den osmanischen Sultan. The conquest of Constantinople in 1453 by the Osman Sultan is an important milestone in the expansion westwards. Now, Europeans find it harder to seek routes to Asia, to India, or even further afield. Later, it's Columbus, who must have been born around this time, probably in 1451, it's Columbus who later concludes that to reach the east, you have to sail west. You have to take a completely different route, round Sipango, Japan and Cathay, to reach China, and even India. During the 1450s, undeterred, the Portuguese continue to search out routes to the south. Since 1434, under Henry the Navigator, they have pushed forwards, exploring the coast of Africa. And in the 1450s, they've already reached West Africa. This success is only possible because Henry the Navigator has founded a research center, the School of Navigation in Sagres. Here, the geographical knowledge of the age is systematically collected and evaluated. The School of Navigation provides Portuguese sea captains with the first reliable maps. With the help of these charts, they survey the newly discovered coastlines step by step, adding new information. With every voyage, the maps become increasingly accurate and extensive. The subsequent Christian conquest of the world is a consequence of the art of cartography. The sign of the cross testifies to the success of this scientific cartography. Henry the Navigator is an honorary title. He never goes to sea himself, but he finances the voyages of exploration, and each one lifts a little the veil concealing the undiscovered world. The first big step into the unknown has been taken.